for inviting me to speak at this. So um, Phil and I have actually um, merged our presentations. So I'm going to start out um, by giving you some national perspective on these issues we've been talking about. And um, uh, we are working on a major paper uh, that aims to synthesize the research findings on the impact of location on kids, um, present data on the location of assisted families with children nationally, and uh, make policy recommendations. So uh, this is a table that will be in our paper. Um, so I want to highlight a few things. I know this is a lot of numbers, but I'm just going to pick out a few of them. Um, first of all, I have to admit I was kind of shocked to find that more than one quarter of poor children in this country who live in extreme poverty areas, defined by the census as 40% or more of the residents are poor, so somewhat poorer than um, the focus we were hearing about from Barbara earlier. Um, one quarter of those poor children receive federal housing assistance. So that's pretty stunning about the role of the federal housing assistance programs in terms of contributing to concentrated poverty. So just one note about, so why did we focus on um, census tracts that are 40% or more poor? Why didn't we look at 30%? Uh, and I'm throwing this out because I think it's actually an important issue as we think about the future. I think there are three major reasons. There's some research that indicates things really are worse at the 40% threshold. Um, we wanted a number that seemed like a more manageable one to solve. So that's kind of a more of a local political decision, but from a national perspective, um, it seemed like a good idea. But the, the clincher for us was, um, that HUD's proposed affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, which Phil will talk about some, focuses on areas that are 40% um, or more poor and racially or ethnically concentrated. So we thought, OK, there's some momentum here. Let's drive that in our discussion. Um, so what I mostly want to talk about is uh, to just show you from the slide um, <coughs> is if you look at the highlighted line near the bottom, which is the extremely poor census tracts, so 18% um, of the families with children who get housing assistance of any type from HUD and for whom we could get geographic information in 2010 and 2011 um, live in these extremely poor census tracts. But like most averages, that hides what's really important, which is the difference among the programs. And um, so if you look on the left side, it's 10%, 9.8% of housing voucher families, 35% um, of public housing families with kids, 22% in the privately owned project, Section 8 project-based rental assistance program. And so I just want to emphasize again, this is data just on assisted families with kids. Most of the data you see published ever does not focus on families with kids, it's overall. And in the project-based programs, that um, looks less bad, because families with kids in the project-based programs live in poorer neighborhoods. Um, it doesn't make that much of a difference, actually, in the voucher program, but makes a really significant difference in the project-based. Um, so you might think, so what's the great big deal voucher program, 10% of the kids live in these neighborhoods? Well, um, I think our question ought to be, why do any kids with a housing voucher live in these neighborhoods? And 10% of the voucher program is nearly a quarter of a million children. Nearly a quarter of a million children, not insignificant. Um, Um, and the other, um, I, I didn't do the um, table on education because I knew somebody else would talk about that today, but um, these data come from a really interesting study by um, a, a guy named Michael Lenz at UCLA 
who has used the crime data um, and cross matched it with assisted housing data um, to talk about exposure to um, high crime neighborhoods and high violent crime neighborhoods. Um, so if you, he didn't include the private um, project based rental assistance program, but you can see that public housing tenants and uh, are um, substantially more exposed not only to high crime but particularly to high violent crime than poor renters generally. So almost 24% of public housing tenants are in uh, high violent crime neighborhoods compared to 11% of poor renters overall. Um, voucher program does much better than that, um, but only slightly better than poor renters generally, the very large majority of whom do not have rental assistance. Um, I should say there's a lot of other interesting data in his study that breaks this down by race. And um, interestingly, and I'll get back to this later, um, the voucher program does much better in avoiding high crime and high violent crime neighborhoods for black families compared to other black families. So the reality here is that black families, regardless of income, live in much more violent neighborhoods than comparable white families. Um, but the voucher seems to be a more powerful tool for them. Um, so now I'm going to turn this over to Phil, who is going to um, talk about what can we do about these implications of these data under existing policy, and then I'll come back to talk about um, what we think are the most important and doable um, po federal policy changes. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Uh, even if we uh, don't get, as we hope, to the uh, federal policy reforms we're aiming to achieve, um, in, in this administration, and I do very much hope and expect that we will get some serious voucher reform in the next two years. But even if we don't get there, there's nothing stopping um, a state um, housing department or a local uh, public housing agency or city housing department from instituting some of the things we're talking about here today on their own. They don't need a lot. They don't need a Thompson lawsuit to do it. Um, the value of federal policy reform is you create incentives and top-down requirements um, that you know create that political will on the local level to, to, to make this happen. Um, it's sometimes the financial wherewithal uh, to do it. Um, about your families living in these distressed neighborhoods um, can be notified um, and uh, at very low cost about their about their options. Um, uh, oftentimes. Uh, what the research has shown is that uh, uh, housing agencies, when families come in for uh, looking uh, to, to move or change their unit or become recertified after their first year, will uh, be looking for a new place to live, either because they're, they've grown disillusioned with their neighborhood or their unit or whatever, and they're given a list of, of uh, landlords or potential apartments. Um, very often this list is just a passive list collected from landlords who are interested in renting to voucher families. This tends to be in the most concentrated segregated neighborhoods in a jurisdiction. Um, they're not lists that are calculated to give families choices, the kind of choices Thompson families receive. Very simple things PHAs, public housing agencies, can do uh, right now to change the default options for families. Um, there are a number of things uh, which are parallel to some of the federal reforms we're talking about. Um, increasing rents in higher opportunity areas is something that public housing agencies can do right now as a matter of right. Um, they can adjust the rents upward based on a very simple uh, study submitted to HUD based on HUD data, um, which would give families more options in more areas and get over the problem of low rents that's plagued the voucher program. Um, if you put those things in place, the, the next most important thing is how do you get these very precious housing choice vouchers to the families, the children, in the most distressed neighborhoods? And the answer is actually more simple than you might imagine. Um, any local PHA in its annual plan 
can change the preferences um, to prioritize families with kids or families with young kids. Uh, basically moving them higher up on the wait list, giving them a special priority. Um, that just needs to be submitted in the annual plan and it will be approved uh, by HUD. Um, many PHAs have wait lists that are closed for good reason. They have so many people on them. Um, if you open the wait list um, and create uh, special preferences or set aside for families with kids in these uh, targeted neighborhoods, you can very quickly move families to the top of the list, much more quickly than is happening now. Uh, Barbara mentioned, just as a thought experiment perhaps, um, if you have 12,000 vouchers on the street right now in Baltimore, not including the Thompson uh, vouchers, we'd expect a turnover of, say, what, 1,000 of these vouchers a year, um, maybe. Maybe less, but you, know, you get the idea. A lot of new vouchers opening up which can go to families that don't have vouchers now. If we prior are prioritizing those to families with young kids, we could really direct some of these resources to the, the families that need them. Um, those are just a few things local public housing, housing agencies can do, and there's more. And uh, one of the documents that we handed out at the door, if you haven't gotten one, you should grab it, is an excerpt from uh, our uh, HUD policy brief from last year that kind of runs through uh, a lot of the Section 8 voucher reform agenda for HUD. What's really interesting about that is um, most of the stuff can be done by a PHA right now. Um, last thing up there is uh, the concept of a prescription for a new neighborhood. Um, this was a um, proposal a number of us uh, put out there about um, three years ago. Um, and it was really at that time a legislative idea uh, requiring congressional legislation. So we haven't emphasized it that much lately. Um, but, um, but it has local uh, applicability as well. The basic idea was to create a new federal voucher program with a, small, with a pot of vouchers uh, designed to help um, at-risk children or children with, with uh, identifiable uh, Conditions like asthma or trauma, you know, uh, uh, trauma, mental, mental, mental uh, illness issues, uh, depression, uh, trauma, um, and to prioritize um, mobility vouchers for that set of kids. Um, and this is really based on th there's several of these boutique voucher programs at the federal level: the Housing and Services for Homeless Persons, the Family Unification Program, the Veterans Affairs Supplemental Housing Program. <coughs> These are programs which set aside a special pot of vouchers Congress has created with some wraparound health services with HHS and HUD working together. Why not do the exact same kind of program for kids and these, these at-risk kids with wraparound um, health services and HHS um, uh, involvement? Um, we still think that's a great idea when, we, when Congress gets its act together at some point. We hope to revive that. In the meantime, um, in a place like Baltimore or Philadelphia or wherever a mobility program is happening, we'd like to kind of explore this idea. Um, can we work with the, uh, the pediatricians, uh, the public health uh, um, community? Uh, as Carol Payne was mentioning yesterday, the sort of maternal and infant uh, health um, providers and outreach folks to kind of target um, uh, the families that, that are most in need of the services um, that we've been talking about here, and work together, working together with the public housing agency on a program like this, um, you know, create a prescription for a new neighborhood for specific kids. Um, and this has raised, you know, some of the research problems that we identified early on um, have to do with not just, you know, what is the cost savings that might flow from that, but do pediatricians really know enough to um, say, you know, here's a kid who... Um, <coughs> is having sort of identifiable health issues, um, um, like Sabrina uh, was describing her, her child. Um, and this is a kid who would benefit from a move to a healthier neighborhood. Um, you know, how do, you, how do, do, we, do we have the, do pediatricians have the expertise to work with public housing agencies and sort of write the doctor's letter for the family to say, yes, this family should go to the top of the wait list? Interesting question for the public health people in the room, maybe. Um, and I just remember one of the focus groups we had a couple years ago, um, it sort of raises the complexity of this for me, 
uh, we were talking about asthma, and some of the folks were saying, yeah, asthma got better. And this one of the women said, no, no not for my kid, because um, her asthma got better initially, but then there were so many trees in the, in the, where we moved to. <laughs> so that actually, so it, it's not always what you expect, because, um, so uh, those are just some ideas, and we're, we're still kind of working on these policy proposals, and I'll, I'll let uh, Barbara sketch them out in no, more detail. You have to do the F of H rule. Oh, the AFFH rule. Um, <laughs> we didn't, re okay. didn't rehearse. No, we did. <laughs> okay, well, all of this that we're talking about is in the context of what we hope is a major sea change at HUD. Um, finally, after many years of deliberation, HUD has put out a proposed rule on affirmatively furthering fair housing. This is a, an implementation of the duty that is imposed on all HUD grantees to avoid policies that promote segregation, and to affirmatively promote racial integration in local programs. And it's, it's a specific focus that local jurisdictions and public house, housing agencies are supposed to be doing to look at um, areas of concentrated poverty in their jurisdictions and the degrees of segregation, and to kind of figure out what, what are the barriers, what, what's creating these patterns, and what are we going to do about it. There's hope at HUD that this will create a new national conversation will create community engagement um, so that public housing agencies and local housing departments are forced to come to grips with this and say, what can we do about this? And I th we think housing mobility is like uh, on the short list of things that can be done to start to reverse some of these trends. If this rule is finalized, that's a big if, but we're hoping to see a final rule, uh, Barbara. Um, uh, we're hoping to see a final rule <laughs> this spring or summer or fall. Um, <laughs> We're hoping to see fall. one very soon. Fall. Oh, from I'd the say from, fall. <laughs> okay, well, if those are the choices. Well, it, you're probably if right. it's 2014, that would be great. No, we're hoping to see. A, <laughs> we are hoping to see a final rule, and, and this final rule will be the context to have many more of these conversations about housing mobility, and, I, and I hopefully uh, to proliferate a lot of the, the techniques and, and um, approaches we're talking about here. Okay, so. Um, as part of the segue into um, talking about and what further policy changes could really make a difference, I wanted to show um, the glass half full um, side of the data. I emphasize the glass half empty of the, <coughs> the families in the t excessive number of families in the extremely poor neighborhoods. But our, our analysis also showed that even under existing policy with no big emphasis on um, better locational outcomes except in a relatively small number of, of programs, um, we can see that housing vouchers really do make a difference in helping poor black and Hispanic families live in low poverty neighborhoods where the poverty rate is less than, than 10%. So same data set as the first uh, table, um, and really interesting difference broken down by race. Again, this is all families with children, and here we um, cut off the analysis and looked only at families whose incomes is below, are below the federal poverty level, so it's a, a not the full set, um, and so that we would have apples and apples comparison to, other, to all poor children. So 17% of poor black kids in families that receive Housing Choice Voucher Assistance live in census tracts that are less than 10% poor, compared to 7% of all poor black children. Not quite as dramatic, but still big difference for Hispanic poor kids, where 15% of them, uh, if they have vouchers, live in uh, low poverty neighborhoods, compared to almost 9% of Hispanic poor children generally. The opposite happens for white families, where um, having a voucher actually decreases by a couple of percentage points the share of um, white poor children in families that get vouchers. So I'm seeing a lot of um, furrowed brows. So let me just say that um, it, it, this is an exacerbation over the decade 2000-2010 of a trend that was sort of showed up in the 2000 data, quite different in the 2010 data. This probably has something to do with changes in neighborhoods 
and something to do with restriction um, in the um, choices that families have of where to rent when they have a voucher, i.e. voucher discrimination. But that's just my hunch. Um, so um, oh, one thing I want to say before I, I get into the, these other policy changes, I don't think the only choice we ought to be talking about is ex higher extreme poverty versus low poverty. Um, I think particularly the data suggests that particularly if the focus is safety versus schools, I think there's a big difference. Um, you can get a big increase in safety by moving to somewhat less poor neighborhoods. And that is one of the most important things that I think the Moving to Opportunity results stand for. Um, and so we should be looking for achievable goals. Um, those moves may be more possible and families may be more willing to do them. It may enable them to stay in the safer neighborhoods of cities where they don't get so far removed from other content, um, uh, their social networks. Okay, quickly on um, other key HUD policy changes. So um, the major point to keep in mind on any of these details is these are all things that the Obama administration could do on its own without congressional permission and without spending any more money. I don't know how many times I need to say this. Um, in order, like, the president did his whole State of the Union speech on that he's going to do the things he can do. We didn't hear anything about housing mobility on that list. Um, and it really belongs there. So these are sort of buckets of policy, um, but to make them understandable. Um, I think there would be a lot of change if only agencies were incentivized and rewarded for their performance on location. Um, I think the AFFH rule is a big part of that. Um, HUD also can change the performance measurement systems uh, for the voucher program, which right now um, essentially comes close to doing nothing about location. Um, secondly, um, HUD and to some extent local housing authorities could modify policies that actually now induce families to live in high poverty neighborhoods. It's really important to understand federal policy is not neutral here. This is kind of like back to the history of segregation. Policies in the voucher program that look neutral on their face, a number of them have the effect of inducing families to choose to live in high poverty neighborhoods. About the biggest one, I think, is setting what are called the fair market rents, which are the, the, uh, the metric which determines the maximum voucher subsidy, setting that metric on a metropolitan-wide basis. Think about it for a moment. Um, if you average rents over a metropolitan area, they're too high in the least expensive areas, and they're too low in the most expensive areas. Duh. Um, and while housing authorities have flexibility, as Phil mentioned, to change that, um, they um, very rarely have exercised it. And their flexibility to go down in the low rent areas is actually less than their flexibility to go up in the others. So if HUD were to shift to setting the fair market rents on a small area, HUD's experimenting with zip code set rents, which they have in Dallas, thanks to another lawsuit that Betsy instigated, um, then uh, I think we would see a major difference on this. It's not a, not a panacea, but it's one very important piece. The third is the administrative geography of the voucher program itself. Um, few people appreciate um, that we have over 2,300 different separate agencies administering the housing voucher program in this country. My favorite factoid is more in the state of Massachusetts than in the state of California. Think about that. Um, and the effect of that is that 
Uh, it is, while the, the policy for decades in the voucher program has been that once a family has a voucher and maybe after they've lived in um, a place for a year, they can move virtually anywhere in the country. Very few families actually do move from one jurisdiction to another, and that is not an accident. In addition to all the issues we've been talking about, about their understanding about what their options are, it's very hard to do. And housing authorities have no incentive. In fact, they have every incentive not to really tell people about these choices. Um, they lose money when families move. Um, and it takes more time, and it's more difficult. And there are barriers to the families. Um, HUD has proposed some changes in this, the policy called portability that will, even if they do everything they propose and the other things we recommended, it would go only part of the way to doing it. We really need to bite the bullet around reducing the number of separate agencies. And I, there's a very um, unsexy way to go at this. Um, I, um, with great respect for Bruce Katz and Mark Turner in their latest article, once again, pushing for regional administration, again, I would go for the gettable. Um, and I think that is um, more likely to be uh, to allow agencies to voluntarily combine together. Phil is rushing me. Um, so, <laughs> um, the, um, it, it, just changing the focus from the voucher program for a minute. Um, remember the 35% of families with kids in public housing who are in these extremely poor neighborhoods? We actually have a policy opportunity opening up to begin to really do something about that. HUD has started um, what's called the rental assistance demonstration, which is allows housing authorities, um, or some of them, to convert um, public housing properties to a Section 8 rental stream. And as part of that, families will have the option to move with an available voucher after one to two years. And think about if HUD, given that this is the Secretary's major priority in the rental housing space, um, were to use that option to really demonstrate the lessons from all the learning that has gone on around the country and make these model programs. Um, and finally, you heard people talk about a supply, the importance of a supply strategy in neighborhoods without enough rental housing. Great idea, but it has to be housing that will actually accept vouchers or it won't be part of the solution to the problem. Um, the good news is, there is a federal statutory requirement already that the low-income housing tax credit units not discriminate against voucher holders. That's the good news. The bad news is no federal guidance has ever been issued about what that means. There's no enforcement, um, and we could do better. Um, but finally, the kind of um, mobility counseling programs that you've been hearing about in Baltimore, Dallas, um, and in the Chicago area, um, those are inexpensive. And the administrative fees that housing authorities now get um, are, even this year, with a significant increase, are at about 80% um, maybe of their formula eligibility. So I think, and that's not likely to get any better. So um, while housing authorities can do a lot I think it's, um, we've, we've got to acknowledge that uh, they're going to need help to really achieve large numbers of the um, moves to low poverty, uh, non-racially concentrated neighborhoods. Um, some of that help could come from state and local governments in the form of carrots and sticks to get landlords to be more accepting of vouchers. Illinois has an interesting law that was passed in the last few years that gives a property tax reduction to landlords that rent to voucher holders. Um, then there's the stick of strong and strongly enforced uh, source of income discrimination laws. We could amplify that list a lot, but you get the idea. Um, and the F of H rule will play a role, we hope, in bringing the states and uh, city governments to the table uh, around these policy changes. The other part of it, though, is actually funding the housing search assistance programs and building the knowledge base on what works. Uh, and I think 
Um, there we need to be looking, um, in addition to government, uh, we really need to be looking to the world of philanthropy. And I will stop here. You know, I, I was in this before and not introducing a new, uh, a new attendee here. Robert Lieberman is the co-host at John Hopkins, and we're very fortunate to have him here to help moderate this conversation. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I apologize that I haven't been here up until now, and I apologize in advance that I'm going to have to dash right after this session. I was hoping to stick around for part of the afternoon, but, um, you know, things happen. Um, so, first of all, I should say I feel a little bit fraudulent being here because I'm not an expert in housing policy. I'm not an expert in public health or well-being um, or many of, any, many of the things that you have been discussing. Um, what I what I do have spent a lot of my career back when I had a research career thinking about is sort of the political surroundings of policies like this and particularly the sort of um, intersection of race and politics around policy these kinds of policies um, so I just want to I want to make I'll, I'll be trying to be very quick and just raise some 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 questions um, um, that we might that might spark some uh, discussion. So, the first is if we can if you can go back to the very first of your slides, the one with all the numbers on it. Um, the social scientists automatically gravitate towards slides like this. <laughs> um, so this is quite a the, this this highlighted line, the one that Barbara talked about, is quite stunning. The the apparent um, success of housing choice vouchers in moving families. Uh, moving poor families out of high concentrated, the highest concentration poverty uh, neighborhoods. So this is the, but this is also the sort of um, table that makes a social scientist reach for his wallet um, for the following reason. So this is, uh, uh, this is my, this is, this is the one really pointy headed analytic, social science analytical question that I'm going to ask. And that is a question of essentially selection or treatment. Um, that is, the inference, the, uh, the inference that, that jumps off of this page that we would like to be able to make is, that, is exactly what I just said, that these policies are actually successful compared to alternatives, compared to public housing, project-based assistance, or nothing. Um, that, these pro that this policy is actually, this policy instrument is actually successful in moving families out of poor neighborhoods. Um, but what if there's something about the characteristics, systematically, about the characteristics of the families that take up these vouchers that make them more likely to move? So no, that well, that's a that's a perfectly legitimate question, but that but that but that suggests that scaling up the policy or expanding the policy might not, right? If you if you've taken the families with certain characteristics, and I don't know, there may be an answer to this question, and there may be research that answers this question that I'm not familiar with. Um, so, but the leap, but but the the inference from this table that these policies are a success, period, full stop needs more context around it is my only is my only point um, um, and that's a perfectly valid question that right if, if if the policy is helping some families it's a success and that's fine um, but um, but it does, but it raises an analytical question this is this is the exam this is the advantage of being a you know on the faculty of a university I can raise the questions and then leave the room um, and leave it to the policy people to really have to worry about answering them um, but I want to raise some other questions, a, co one, a couple of other points that are just really, really fascinating about this policy area um, that, that intersects with some of the things that I've been thinking about in the last few years. And one is um, really, really two, two things. One is there's a, there's a tension in the way this discussion is framed here between what I've called in, in other work uh, what you might call sort of colorblind approaches to policies like this and, and race conscious policies like this. Um, what we're, in, 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 in many respects, what we're describing here um, are racially disparate effects of racially neutral policy, policy instruments. And in fact, for, for many years, housing choice, housing um, is a sort of classic case of this phenomenon. Um, um, 
So and the and the way the both the slides and the presentation sort of describe the policy intervention here sort of oscillates between a neutral frame that is we are talking about poverty we're talking about class effects we're talking about poor neighborhoods and the <coughs> and at the other end the sort of clear directive of housing policy and the clear um, legal and uh, framework that HUD operates under to address not just uh, concentrations of poverty, but also segregation. Um, that just raises for me a question. This is one that I've been thinking about for my entire professional career, and I don't have an answer, which is, again, one of the advantages of being a professor is you can throw out these questions and then leave the room. Um, 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 how, do we, how do we think about the, that uh, tension here. There are two things going on here. One is we're, we're trying to attack poverty, we're trying to attack class effects, um, and, the, and, the, and the sort of concentration of economic deprivation. But we're also at the same time trying to, trying to attack and trying to, to, to think about um, uh, um, um, racial segregation. Um, both, and those things have different kinds of politics around them, different legal frameworks, and so on and so forth. Uh, just really, again, just a question that, that leapt out at me from this really fascinating presentation. And finally, um, when we get to the, um, the policy underpinnings of all of this, I mean, I think the, 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 the policy prescriptions that come out of this are extraordinarily powerful, especially the, the, the sense that there's an enormous amount of low-hanging fruit here in the policy sense. Things that could easily be done, or not easily be done, but could readily be done um, without having to get into Congress and all of those things. I think that's, that's an enormously powerful um, uh, set of points. Um, at the same time, we know historically that housing mobility is an extremely, has been an extremely politically contentious and conflict-ridden arena. Um, and the, uh, the question that arose for me at the end, toward the end of the presentation and the end of the last few slides is, what is, it, is there something that we can latch on to about this policy instrument, this kind of intervention, um, that would raise our confidence that it would assuage some of the conflict and contention and, and political you know, grind that these kinds of policies have occasioned in the past. Again, I, you know, I would like to think that the research base, the clarity of these, of the prescriptions, the sort of political path that you lay out to achieving some of these things would do some of that work. Um, but again, it raised for me a really profound question about, you know, given the political moment that we're in right now, um, 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 given the history of, of uh, conflict around these kinds of, of moves in the past, um, you know, what can we say about the politics surrounding um, 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 these policies? So just a set of questions that I hope will provoke some discussion, and there are lots of people in the room who are much more knowledgeable and deeply uh, embedded in these policy areas than I am. Um, so uh, I hope that um, sparks some discussion, and again, thanks for having me. Associate, but I actually think quite a lot of housing programs work if they're done well and if they're sustained. And that our social science model makes us ask the wrong question. Because if you were able to self-select into housing, you'd be really lucky. Um, and you'd probably be pretty rich. If you would look at the state of the nation's housing, just getting housing at all for the lower 20% of the population is extremely difficult. Maintaining it and not having to spend your whole food budget and your whole medical care budget on it is very difficult. So I think it's a red herring. I've tried to develop a model that I call the housing niche model about how you get funneled into a housing niche. And I think this um, mobility programs are an effort to move out of that so that you get funneled into the beginning of a different kind of a housing niche. But I really think we should maybe try to not ask that, like this for a randomized clinical trial of a drug. You could only do that on people in prison. Um, otherwise, housing should be a choice. I know somebody works in black here. Thanks. Thank you. I think it, um, I just want to throw a couple of things out. I mentioned some of these yesterday. Um, 
So I mentioned um, um, Robert Sampson's work, Great American City, um, and I would also mention uh, Ira Castanel's new book, Here Itself, and then I mentioned um, Ian Hank Lopez's book, um, of Politics, and then an article I wrote on the race class um, conundrum in the United States. And just to say a little bit about that, I won't take too much time. But I think largely it's a false dichotomy. What um, uh, Cass Nelson is doing in Fear itself is he's looking at institution design. Uh, so he's looking at programs, design, uh, the movie, um, and how racial considerations were profoundly important for the design of those programs. But he's not looking at the effects of those programs in terms of racial categories, which is what we do. Um, and give just a, a quick example. Think about uh, electoral college. There's a lot of indication that electoral college was largely designed to actually enhance slaveholding states. Um, but it affects everybody. So today we might think of electoral college not only as uh, neutral in design, although I would say it's not, but also neutral in effect. I would say it's not that easy. Correct. Um, so I think the United States when we call it to segregate class and race from our perspective, we do it overly simplistic. And, and our sense of class is actually borrowed from a European model that doesn't work. Uh, myself, um, David Bodeker, uh, Wages of Whiteness, he argues that if you look at construction of the white working class uh, pre and post Civil War, race animated that profoundly. So here, when we think about working class and whiteness, it's already profoundly racialized. Uh, so, um, and then finally, I would say, we talk about public housing, and urban areas especially, we're talking about black folks. Uh, and there's always a disparity between who lives in extreme poverty, who lives in public housing. It's just profoundly racialized. And I think, from my perspective, we're talking about the as important as the data is on the narrative, that's not going to give. There's profound racial anxiety in this country that we can empirically measure, but we don't engage uh, there's also important research suggesting that the economic segregation of housing is actually growing across the board, in part because the elite, the white, rich, are opting out of living around the rest of us, which we also never talk about. Uh, so in some sense, I would say this is more complicated and, and, and larger, but in other sense, I would say it's not. And I would actually really counsel not to spend too much time really trying to decide, if it's, is it race or is it class? Is it SES? Again, I would recommend my article on that. And as I said yesterday, I think a, um, uh, looking at multiple indicators at once, it's actually much richer than taking a single indicator to try to find out which one is this right. First of all, thanks for the list of, uh, of policy prescriptions. You uh, made our uh, breakout group a lot easier. Uh, which, uh, 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 if we could have a copy of that, that would be great. <laughs> I, I, I ask these questions really only because I think your point about maybe just having a voucher as part of the solution is really, really important. And there are two, but, but I, I, two questions about that. But, but one is a comment, one is a question. So first of all, um, I found the MTO results really interesting, both because the, in the experimental group, the poverty improvements were not as dramatic as we thought, but there were huge health benefits. But what was really interesting, too, was what was going on in the Section 8 only group, which is a group that only got vouchers. And there, one of the two health indicators was also positive. No one writes about it. It wasn't as powerfully significant. But that seems to be partly because they skimped on the sample. And, and they only uh, uh, had a, uh, they did not use as big a sample of the Section 8 group as they did of the experimental group. At least that's my reading of it, and I assume that's for budgetary reasons. But that is a huge missing link we really should be looking at. What's the effect of just getting a voucher? But now on the flip side of that, when I look at your charts, Barbara, I do wonder whether, have you control for geography? I'm a little worried that if you have it, part of what we might be seeing I thought this particularly when I saw the slides about the white uh, folks with and without vouchers. I mean, what if it turns out that the people, the white households with vouchers live in much higher poverty metro areas than the whites without vouchers who might be uh, kind of poorer whites in the, in the south who live in, in sort of 
uh, more moderate poverty areas. And so it seems to me that on both of these charts, and the flip, my flip side might be true here, that, that the voucher holders might be more likely to live in somewhat lower poverty areas than the public housing residents. And so I just think somehow this would be much more powerful if you could control for geography and make sure that when we were comparing different forms of housing assistance that we were looking in the same place. So we're not looking at the same places. Um, that's for sure. Um, the vouchers generally are more urban than public housing or project-based rental assistance. So although once you control and you look only at data for families with children, you minimize those differences. Um, we didn't. We haven't done that. My instinct is it wouldn't actually make that much of a difference. I mean, the data on um, if, if I had shown you the whole um, table by race, um, there's just um, white families just do a whole lot better in being the one, two, or three families with a voucher in a low poverty census tract. They just have penetration in a lot more neighborhoods, which is partly the answer to your point. Um, with the ex with a few exceptions, and you had traumatic um, experience in the Baltimore area in the 90s with MTO, where voucher holders move is pretty invisible. Almost all of the political reaction in local communities um, that looks like it's anti-voucher is really about race and is um, largely about families of color who move to newer neighborhoods who don't have housing assistance. There's just the stereotype that, well, if they're black and they're moving to my neighborhood, they must have a voucher, um, which is generally not true. So, um, so to some extent, I think it's really important to remember that um, not denying what you said about the um, continuing racial barriers and, and, and what John Powell said, I think a lot of this can just kind of happen under the radar by we have a lot of vouchers out there and a lot of administering agencies through, kind of throughout the country. And if agencies um, did a marginally better job, on, <laughs> we would see, I think, big changes. Well, I, I just want to add to that. I know we're out of time. But just on the, the political question, um, housing mobility is important in large part because it avoids uh, the political impacts of the voucher program. You know, an unchecked uh, voucher program, and this is what we saw in Philadelphia, which led to the advocacy up there to get a housing mobility program, is that families are being funneled into suburban areas, the most concentrated parts of uh, the inner ring suburbs. There was no effort to uh, offer families choices in other parts of the counties. They were all going to these very narrow, we, have, we mapped it, the very narrow clustering of neighborhoods. And it was becoming, uh, we're talking about reconcentration of poverty. And, and uh, what a housing mobility program does is it helps families move to a much wider range of neighborhoods. The impact is lower. They're, by definition, going to places where there aren't already lots and lots of voucher holders. And politically, that's very valuable. It also helps to break down the, this sort of the monolithic white high-income community, the less, the less you have of that in a metro and the less you allow sprawl to keep separating people, that helps the, the more diverse, um, you know, both racially and income diverse inner suburbs um, to stabilize them. So it's all, I think, politically it's part of the solution. It's not, it's not a threat. It's actually part of the political solution as well. And I just want to, I think that's really true and a really important point. The other thing we haven't really talked about because of the Baltimore focus of this discussion is where there, as Barbara said, there's not gentrification going on. In a lot of our major cities, gentrification is a huge issue. And the policy priority in part there um, is not, is, is, is staying not moving. It, it is enabling the families with vouchers who want to stay in a neighborhood that is improving to do it despite the rising rents. Um, and many of these policy prescriptions work for that part of the problem as well. But we're, um, we're losing ground as cities improve and voucher holders are being 
push to ever poorer neighborhoods, and we need to also focus on that. I know Betsy have something, and, and Josh, and then... Cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask what... I did not... Yeah. I didn't quite understand that first point about your question, your question about is there, so, is there something about the voucher families that makes that so, sort of select, self-selection, that there's something about voucher families that makes them choose to go to low poverty, lower poverty areas than public housing or the project base. Was that your question? Are there are systematic differences between the families who are in, in these different... What are the systematic differences? I don't know what they are, but well, I mean, I mean, this is like the controlling for geography question. Well, I know, right? but I mean... The, is, the there something, you, is there something that hasn't been controlled for in these data that makes the people in these categories different so that the outcomes are different. Is right? the assumption that people in public housing chose public housing over the voucher? That somehow I, they I, are in that? I mean, because that's really important. Yeah. I think that the whole, to, to raise the well, self-selection raises a very, um, the people in public housing have to go where the government put them. And so to assume that they are in public housing or in the project base, about, that they're in the higher poverty areas because there's something about them, as opposed to the fact there was something about government policy that decided where they go, I think was implicit in the question. And I just wanted to make sure I understood that you, under, you understand that public housing is, is nothing, the families didn't decide where to put that housing that they have to go to to get affordability. To, but yeah. just to be, I, I don't know if you're defended here, but, but to be fair, there where there are where there are options for families, there are some families that choose not to apply to public housing. They only want a voucher, right? So th there 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 are differences. People do choose one program over the other. I feel right? yes. you know I know that, but no. I know you that know, know, that. Not, no, I know no, you no, know. No, 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 no. To suggest that people who are in public housing chose no. to go in public housing as opposed to a voucher or in project based right. is just not true across the board. Now there are there examples of that? Yes. But you can't say that 35 percent of people in public housing want to be in. There's something about them that wanted to be in those highly distressed, lower income no, areas. Yeah, housing, no, no, they're desperate for housing. No, but right. the point, the right. point, just to be clear, the point was not about choice or self-selection in that sense. It's not that the people who are in one category or the other have chosen, out of their own volition, to be in this category. But are there? It's a, it's a, it's a point about the inference that we're making from this table, which is that, you know, be, that that it's because of program A or program B that we see different outcomes, right? So, so I, I think that the, the direct answer to your question, in addition to Betsy's point, but it's the data about where families who were in public housing that was demolished under HOPE 6 and who got vouchers and where they chose to move um, is actually very responsive. And what you see in that data is that almost no families make low poverty moves. Well, they didn't get help. They were under time pressure right. and all the other things we've talked about. But they moved to significantly lower poverty neighborhoods than where they came from. And they thrive in many dimensions. Right. Um, and so, and those are the families from the worst projects. Um, so, um, Everything that everybody's talked about is, is there's some validity to it. Um, but I think this is mostly about what Bessie said, public housing and project based is in a place. Um, and people who are desperate for affordable housing will take what they can no, get. Yes, no um, and people with choices do better. So maybe this is a Josh Simon LDF, yeah, maybe this is leading to the next uh, discussion, I'm not sure, but since we're talking about politics and pragmatics, I'm interested in if we look at the list of the low hang or lower hanging fruit fruit maybe, um, and think about uh, two and a half years of an administration left, uh, and think about um, what, what building uh, um, coalitions and uh, pressing the levers to get some of those policies in place. Um, can you guys talk about or, or set our quest for further conversations about, you know, what should be the unusual allies and unlikely suspects? What should be the ones that are the particularly low paying fruits to move on? To move on, um, especially given your experience with that. Um. So, um, my vote uh, on uh, to answer that question is. Um, 
Uh, I mean, I'll take any allies we can get. Um, I think the public health focus is a really important one for policy wonks and intellectually and framing it, but um, there are not a lot of boots on the ground in the public health world, and they're very busy with healthcare implementation. Um, so maybe in a second generation around healthcare, I think that will be more fruitful. In the short run, I think it's really important to influence the world of children's advocates and the broader world of poverty advocates. I mean, I, I have now worked for the Center on Budget for more than 15 years, and it is still the case that um, my boss is about the only person who comes from um, the sort of core anti-poverty um, income-focused assistance world who talks about housing as a remedy. Um, when he testified at um, the Ways and Means Committee in the House last week on um, 50 years of the war on poverty and what should we do next, um, he actually raised um, more vouchers and better policy to have better location results as one of the three policy recommendations to Paul Ryan because this didn't get a lot of publicity. Paul Ryan actually said that um, when asked what anti-poverty programs does he like, he said he likes the housing voucher program. So, um, you know, I wouldn't get too excited about that, but it, <laughs> it's an opening. And um, the, um, so anyway, if you, we did a blog yesterday on, on the center's website that highlights the housing portion of Bob's testimony. But these worlds are very, uh, if you will, segregated or siloed. And um, there's in I, I've looked at the um, policy manifestos of a lot of the children's groups and the foundations that fund children's work. Usually, there's nothing about housing, and if there is anything, it is pure pablum. Um, so we who care about this agenda have a lot of um, foreign policy to do here. I mean, we need to reach out to people and we need to educate them. I had one reaction just as a practicing pediatrician, this notion of, of pediatricians being equipped in some ways to provide prescriptions for um, better neighborhoods. And uh, so having kind of a split uh, split personality part, kind of public health person, policy law, and then uh, clinician. I, I would just, uh, with with love and respect for my profession, say that I think the, the mindset and awareness of this entire um, policy space and debate is mm -hmm. at such a stage that it, it might be um, premature to think that people are programmed in such a way as to um, immediately think about these connections to larger um, sort of anti-poverty and, and, and housing mobility <coughs> assistance programs as even an existing mechanism, um, let alone uh, have a level of understanding that would, would equip them to be able to make those types of decisions. So, um, but I do think in the context of health <coughs> and much of the focus that is um, being placed on um, scaling up approaches to improving health outcomes that are more thoughtful about social context and its influence on health could provide opportunities for us to begin to um, to create some, some common understanding um, among populations. Um, I think pediatricians in particular pride themselves on being a group of physicians who aren't just advocating for their own reimbursement rates and for their sort of improved livelihood, but always have as a core value um, and a core uh, focus for advocacy efforts and for <coughs> children. But I just would caution the notion that there's an understanding of the sort of complex um, pathway or um, system loops, interactions <coughs> affecting children's health trajectories, um, particularly with respect to the housing policy and social policy more broadly. This 
Hutchless is all things that are within HUD's power to do without any legislation, right? Yes, yes, yes. So why are we just getting <laughs> yes. in HUD's space and shaping them and saying, why aren't you doing this? You know, and they're like, they're part of the problem. All your data suggests that they're part of the problem. Obama's not running anymore, you know? I mean, I think rather than expending a lot of energy trying to get all these stone pipes to talk about, there should be a, a big push, ask for a meeting with Sean Donovan and other people, and shame them and stop being so damn polite with them. They should be embarrassed. She has not been polite. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> So, so amen, but but let me tell you, I don't think that kind of inside strategy is enough. Um, but, but I'm saying we're, I don't know that we're doing it, and I, I so I mean, so Phil and I have been, in the White House. I mean, I, I I'm talking about the Clinton days. It, it, you can get a lot done if someone inside wants it done. Yeah. You know, and you can talk to everybody else. But I think that is the biggest leverage point there is for everything that this roundtable cares about today. So let's let's talk about how I, I can tell you. Um, so um, when I left HUD a little over three years ago, I left the secretary asked for my recommendations on mobility. The uh, departing OMB official with authority over HUD asked for my recommendations on mobility. I didn't have them quite so boiled down then, but I gave them all of yeah, this. Yeah, but you didn't have somebody publicly yeah. shaming them. And I was going to say, you know, sometimes well, that's, they need to be shamed. Right, public. so that has to be, I mean, right. that has to be right. external. Right, exactly. Yes. That's Bill's job. That's right. <laughs> Bill doesn't shame. I'm sorry. I'm totally shame. Like that conversation. I'm happy to shame. Maybe you guys have to shame. We can, we can I together. think shaming is always good. <laughs> That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. Having walked into HUD as a public health person in about 1998 and Certainly not knowing much as much as I know now about mobility and what it means for families, in particular children, but just just the quality of life and health of the residents that we serve. It was like walking into a vacuum. Al and I just had this conversation today about how do we influence this in one region to begin to have the conversation. I'm willing to take that one back because I'm very ballsy. But you will have to have a large discussion, as I said to Al today, because it's bifurcated in the way that work is done. You have Mr. Donovan here, you have Ms. Enriquez here, and you have the region here, and then you have me. And we're split this way. So I think your, your, your uh, d decision or your suggestion of shaming is a good one. But it will still take a lot yeah, I know. to move it. So if that's our strategy, uh, I think taking a regional approach as we, we talked about today. And I'm willing for that region to start with mine. So I, I don't have a problem with that because it's absolutely shameful that HUD would house people in properties that are not fit. It's been my question since we started last evening. How do we scale what we know about how to make communities better for families? Not just out of Thompson, but, but take that goodness out of Thompson. So you have region three, and we can be uh, the beginning uh, of the, the discussion, but that's what it takes. Because we right now approve families to live in properties that are not fit, they pass an inspection that is flawed, and it's okay. But I, I, I mean, I, okay. But you said that the public housing person in charge of Region 3 reports to the public housing person in Washington. That's right. Not to the regional director. That's exactly right. So Region 3 can't go it on its own. We cannot do it alone. So you, you have to uh, gather allies and much to your point about 
the embarrassment, social embarrassment, and shaking. But it has been done in a small way. We do have that one line in the strategic plan, and I use it quite often, uh, that says improving the health and quality of life by using housing as the platform. Make it real. So I won't say anymore. There are also sub goals in goal two. That's right. uh, but the, um, I think this is all part of it. I, I, just the bureaucratic analysis at HUD is um, for a whole set of reasons, some good, some not so good. Um, the division at HUD that runs the voucher program, A, um, undervalues the voucher program. That's a huge issue. People, the voucher program doesn't, literally does not have enough staff to write these rules. Now, of course, they could reallocate staff, and they haven't, but, you know, they have issues. Um, they, uh, people are mixed as to how important this is. I mean, honestly, um, when I knew I was moving out of HUD was when um, the secretary decided in early 2010, um, he gave in to pressure from the assistant secretaries who said, you're trying to make us do too much. We can't do all these things. And the working group, the inter- division working group that I was leading was put on the shelf as too much to think about. And of course, they've never gotten back to thinking about it. Um, I, I am hoping that the AFFH rule will kind of unlock some of that. But I think, I think what, Carol, what you're doing regionally is vital. I think the involvement of uh, Phil's point that some of the PAJs are realizing that they have a self-interest in better mobility policies, because otherwise they're getting screwed. Um, that's huge, because the, the, the general thesis that the regulators are in bed with the regulated and respond to them is quintessentially true of um, the relationship between HUD and the PHAs and with the consequences on the voucher program. So HUD feels all the pressure from the PHAs. They don't feel virtually any pressure from the people sitting in this room. Um, and they're human, you know? They respond to the people who are going to yell at them at, con at the conferences they attend. I won't take you on shame, you can talk about power. And I think part of what I hope will come out of this, we have a pretty broad consensus as to a problem and part of the solution, what's working. But we're, we're, we're stuck at how you scale it up. We're stuck at how you break down the structure. I talked yesterday about local controls, which are this terrible structure. Uh, and we know that. We've known that for years. But what's the strategy to disrupt that? I think shame is part of it. I think power is part of it. And so, you know, we have rough friends at high. I like the secretary, personally. Uh, but there's nothing to do it unless we have a strategy. It's not the field. The doing a great job. But it's us collectively. And so I would say spend some time thinking about institutional bureaucracy, inflection or leverage points in that bureaucracy, our friends and partners in public housing authorities who are willing to do stuff, and so we come up with a multi-level strategy, including implementing counseling and other lawsuits. I mean, so a range of things. So it's not one or the other. Mm -hmm. But if we have, and I think, it, and then at the same time, building more people, both at the academic level, the research level, but also people going, as Cheryl said, kick butt and say, why are we doing this? And one of the things we haven't talked about in the large community, and certainly the black community, there's been a lot of mixed messages about how important is it to have people move to average in the areas. Um, you get from this and others saying, we don't need that. You know, so part of the thing that I think allows for people at HUD and others to sort of not do very much is that when you say that, they say this. And so what are we supposed to do? So we can start breaking through some of that, I think it would be much more helpful. John, thank you. That's a perfect way to bring it back to alignment, to bring it back to really engage a lot, engaging all of these racialized structures that we're working on. I mean, working with and working, being, being confined by, and to get to the next part of our afternoon, which...